Oh, definitely come in person. Oh my gosh, no. If you have the option to go to a conference, go in person. That's the whole point of conferences. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to start going out because we're at the 45 mark. All right, so uh, my name is Brian Carroll, and I'm presenting cache friendly design in robot path planning, which is uh, kind of these two disjoint things I've lobbed together. Um, this is my first live CVPCon. Uh, last year, I attended for the first time remotely, so I'm excited to be here in person, not only to attend, but to also speak. Um, I program in C++ on a daily basis at a, as a robotic software developer, and I have been doing that for the past seven years. Um, but I've been programming C++ since 2012 or so. I mostly worked on uh, mobile robot systems which operate in warehouses, uh, but for the past few months, I've been working at a robot agriculture company called Tortuga AgTech. Uh, so the first time in seven years, I'm finally getting some fresh air. Um, I typically write uh, broader robot systems code, but I've focused mostly on uh, navigation and perception. Um, and besides coding for work, I also code for fun. Um, in a thousand years, I'll finish a game engine. And uh, to procrastinate, I fool around with template metaprogramming. So to begin, uh, let's parse the title of this talk backwards, uh, starting with robot path planning, or more generally, just path planning. This refers to how an autonomous agent figures out how to get from one location to another before actually moving. Um, within robotics, this is going to extend to a variety of subdomains. Um, just as we plan paths for our robot arms to manipulate objects they're grasping, uh, robot vacuum cleaners plan their paths between rooms near, in our houses to pick up cat hair. Um, but the concept of path planning obviously extends outside the domain of robotics. Uh, we have path planning in video games, online mapping services, and uh, even in computer network uh, packet routing. Um, so onto the more uh, kind of philosophical programming focused part of this, which is cache-friendly design. Uh, cache-friendly design refers to program design guided by attempts to prevent slower execution due to the way that memory is accessed. Um, and because most CPUs we actually use these days are faster than our memory hardware, we're accessing data through some complex pipeline of uh, connected cache levels that sit between the CPU and main memory. Most of you know this. Um, and these are indeed important. Um, I found this quote on Stack Overflow that uh, seemed relevant. Um, so robots have brains made of computers. Uh, most of the robots I've ever worked on use pretty much the same CPU hardware that sits on most high-end laptops or gaming computers. So at least within the domain of mobile robotics, I'm covering a lot of ground by claiming that as far as the hardware is concerned, uh, the CPUs we use are not that exotic. Um, typically, in a mobile road system, we have an, ar an architecture that looks like this. Um, we have a bunch of non-hard real-time applications run together in user space. And they're talking to each other through some inter-process message patching protocol. Um, a popular choice for this is ROS, the robot operating system, uh, though it's not actually an OS. Um, and these programs are interfaced with probably some low-level, uh, sometimes real-time, sometimes not, um, system that's actually getting the robot to move, you know, talking to things like motors and sensors. Um, and they usually deal with the things that are safety critical, like uh, dealing with uh, humans that are passing by. At least you hope. All that to say that uh, the most brain-like part of the robot system, uh, we're running some consumer-grade CPU uh, with some consumer-grade memory pipeline. And it's probably organized uh, to something similar that I'm showing in this diagram where we have these small uh, but fast caches close to our cores and some large, slower cache interface with main memory. Anytime one of our high-level programs reads or writes to memory, they do so through the cache. Anytime they execute instructions, they do so by first reading those instructions from the cache. And in order to reduce the amount of times that we need to reach into slow main memory, the cache is populated with possibly relevant data besides the data that our program is currently accessing. This is called prefetching. Um, when things are already in the L1 cache, the CPU is happy because it doesn't need to wait for data to run the next set of instructions. Um, but sometimes the data um, that a program might need has already been removed from the cache or wasn't there to begin with. This is called a cache miss. So cache misses can happen at each level of the cache pipeline. Um, if the data isn't available in the L1 cache line, the L2 cache is checked, so on and so forth. The cache is existing to bridge this gap between our uh, speeds, um, 
the difference in speed between our CPU and memory hardware. And on the happy path, this obviously works. Um, but cache misses potentially add a lot of extra latency to our programs. Um, accessing data each level from the cache from L1 down to main memory is considerably slower than the previous level. So a bad cache miss where uh, there isn't any data available in the cache causes the CPU to wait. Um, this wait is called a CPU stall. So there are mitigations that are beyond our control, such as out-of-order execution, hyper-threading, uh, that allow our CPU to run instructions while it's waiting on a cache miss to be satisfied. But we can certainly attempt to write code in such a way that makes the best use of our cache pipeline. Um, and in order to do that, we will have to minimize the number of cache misses that occur during our, the execution of our programs. So that brings us to the, uh, the high-level goals of this talk. So I'd like to show how to implement some path planning code uh, that can be used on a robot system or, or some other uh, system in a similar domain that is performant, and for the sake of this talk, specifically cache performant. I want to do so with uh, things that are available within the STL. Um, and I will show that we can keep these choices uh, relatively simple. We don't have to uh, deal with uh, memory allocators or writing our own custom memory allocators if we don't actually want to. Um, and I'm also show that we can make these choices guided by measurement. So to begin uh, with an implementation journey, let's focus on a motivating problem. We want our robots to move. This is a, a noble goal, usually harder than it sounds. Um, let's focus on mobile robot systems. Mobile meaning that they should definitely move. Um, and let's focus even more specifically on robots that can pretend they live in a 2D world, like uh, autonomous forklifts moving pallets around, um, home robots moving from room to room to conserve battery, or even outdoor robots like tractors, uh, berry pickers, or delivery systems. Um, even though these robots hallucinate a low dimensional space, uh, moving around is a hard problem because the environment they work in is chaotic. They might experience blockages while driving that they directly observe, or that they're informed about by some central coordinating system, or even information that's shared between them, uh, between other robots. So they likely need to be reactive with how they come up with these new plans towards the goal they're moving to. Um, a hypothetical state machine for navigating a robot might look like this, where we have a robot that's initialized with some information about its environment, typically in the form of a map or a graph. Um, it might get some command to go somewhere else. It'll come up with a high-level reference plan all the way to the goal. We'll call this a global plan. And then it will follow this global plan as a reference while it uses some lower-level optimizer to make adjustments around obstacles. While the local, when the local control system uh, that's used to dodge the obstacles can't figure out how to react, the system will likely drop back on the global planner for a new plan. And this cycle will continue until the robot reaches its intended goal. Um, the problem is that coming up with these global plans, even though they're it's relatively infrequent given the kind of what happens during the, the lifetime of the system, um, they're typically resource intensive. Um, this only gets worse as the uh, state space of your planning problem gets larger. Um, so we're concerned about minimizing the amount of time it takes to come up with a global plan as it factors into how reactive our overall system is. We typically want our robots to look intelligent, so they have to be snappy about rerouting. And someone is paying for these robots to do things, so, you know, time is money. They can't be sitting around for long. So what would a typical environment uh, look like for these robots? An easy example that we can't get away from these days is uh, a mega warehouse butlered by mobile robots. So here I've drawn up a hypothetical um, kind of top-down view of a distribution facility. It's probably kind of hard to see on these screens, but um, it's a bunch of repeated areas with shelves probably holding like protein powder or something, whatever you buy from a big corporation. Um, at the top and bottom, there's areas that the robot might take uh, these goods for pack out, you know, shipping. Um, this facility represents something that is fairly big. Uh, this one is about 0.8 by 0.4 kilometers, but this is by far not the biggest. Uh, where each, each pixel here is about five centimeters of space. And from this, we can extract a spatial graph. Um, I did this using some kind of fancy little Python script. Um, so zooming in uh, to see things a bit better, we see that the graph effectively establishes some nice central pathways between aisles and shelves that the robot can plan along. Uh, these aren't unlike the static network of robots used by Google Maps or a prescriptive pathway we use for characters in a video game. So let's assume these paths were extracted from the graph are all kinematically sane and the robot can traverse them without actually getting stuck when it tries to execute. Um, to get from place to place, a robot would compute a global plan from its current location to some other location in the map. 
Um, so that's kind of our motivator here. So just to get this out of the way, why not pre-compute all possible paths Europa can take rather than run some kind of online search? And probably the best we can do in terms of memory performance is just load sequential blocks of data from memory. And why not just you know, bypass the need for some complicated algorithm in the first place? If it was simply a matter of traveling from vertex to vertex in this graph, we would probably get away from this, even for relatively large graphs. Uh, but as I mentioned, the environment is dynamic. So as soon as edges become inaccessible due to blockages that we can't know ahead of time, the topology of our graph is going to change. So pre-computing every possible plan is just not possible, at least in some combinatorial explosion. Um, so what do we do? We're going to employ a shortest path search algorithm. Um, the kinetical example here is, is Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, it kind of encapsulates a lot of the same flavor of press for a search that we'll see kind of repeating. Um, we also have A star, which is effectively a superset of Dijkstra's. Um, lifelong planning A star, D star, and so on. Um, but from this set, I'm going to focus on Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, the reason for that is because, kind of anecdotally, it's a go-to for path planning systems in a setting where you can know the graph that the robot is planning on ahead of time. Uh, so as such, it kind of covers a lot of practical application ground. It's relatively easy to implement in C++, and uh, I can definitely show you how to implement it in C the STL pretty effectively. So here is a kind of semi-famous Wikipedia graphic showing uh, how Dijkstra's evolves over time. Uh, what we're looking at here is a spatial graph embedded upon some kind of uniform lattice structure like a grid. Um, and in this, this lattice, there's a, an obstacle that the path has to be bent around. Uh, so these, these kind of implicit edges are, are blocked off by uh, like a shelf or something. And here is the actual algorithm. Um, so we're implementing a point-to-point -point version of Dijkstra's. Uh, our function is going to accept some kind of prior graph, a start and goal vertex within that graph. And then we're going to initialize this uh, with a visited set. So it's going to be used to memoize which vertices we've evaluated and how we got there, um, as well as a priority queue, which will contain the next best vertex to evaluate based on their uh, computed total distance from the start. We'll put the vertex in the queue with zero distance, and this will be the first vertex that we pop off the queue. Um, the algorithm will proceed until the queue is empty. At each step, we're going to remove a vertex in the queue with the smallest total distance. If, that, the, if the visited vertex, if the vertex we've, is already visited, meaning we've already evaluated it, we're going to ignore it. Otherwise, we'll record this as visited and take note of how we got there. If the vertex is the goal, we're going to stop the search, since we only care about a path from the start to the goal. Um, I think one, one of the more well-known version of Dijkstra is uh, it's, it's a search from the start to every other vertex in the graph. Uh, if we wanted to kind of modify this algorithm, all we had to do is remove this line, and we have an equivalent to that. Um, if the vertex is not the goal, we're going to inspect every connected vertex that we haven't yet visited and add those vertices to a queue with an updated total distance. We found the goal. The algorithm is going to return to us a set of transitions that we can walk through from the goal to the start. The path that we recover from this is our distance optimal shortest path. Um, so here's another semi-famous uh, GIF showing how A star evolves over time. Uh, kind of what I want to point out is that um, compared to Dijkstra's, the algorithm has to visit less vertices, so the computer is doing less work. Um, and also when compared to Dijkstra's, we see that the algorithms are basically the same. Um, the exception to this is how we compute the next total distance to a given vertex. Um, here we apply a, a heuristic function, H of V, which when summing up our next total distance, it estimates the total cost of the goal, um, which changes the order in which vertices are evaluated. So I'm mentioning this much about A star because the first optimization we can make when implementing Dijkstra is, is just uh, use A star and pick a good heuristic. Um, but for this talk, we're kind of interested in optimizing the work the CPU is doing in a somewhat orthogonal domain. And uh, that said, as you can see, the structure is pretty much the same. So any cache-guided optimizations you can make with Dijkstra's are going to easily carry over to A star. So some more targeted implementation goals here. We want to implement Dijkstra's in C++. We want to use the STL as much as we can. Um, we want to guide our choices that we make here by some kind of cache performance measurement. Um, and then we want to uh, kind of make different choices. Um, so what do we do first? Let's implement the search algorithm. 
So here is Dijkstra's implemented as a templated C++ function. It's um, pretty much verbatim the pseudocode that we just looked at, so I'm not gonna go over it line by line. Um, but one notable exception here is that I chose to implement the, the state of the search that we're gonna be accessing um, as this kind of opaque context object of type C, uh, constrained by a concept search context. Um, and that's going to include our visited set as well as our priority queue. Um, the context bearing object it will be an important customization point as it allows us to reuse some of the resources between successive search attempts. Um, additionally, the graph object of type G constrained by some concept search graph will be our second key customization point. To iterate over the neighboring vertices of the graph, G will expose a method called for each edge, which will invoke a lambda with some edge property information corresponding to each connected vertex. We should notice this in this op uh, implementation, the edges not only bear a weight, um, but a validity flag used in conjunction with the visited, uh, the visited set. Um, the, the purpose of this flag is to represent obstacles that we're going to uh, possibly, um, the are possibly going to occur for our robot. Um, it'll act as, as gates almost. So we can imagine that our robot system might update the edges of our graph before starting the search um, with obstacle information that's either coming from its direct observations or from some central uh, compute, uh, some central coordinating agent. Um, but as such, there might be scenarios we can't actually find a goal. So in these cases, um, we'll simply return false, indicating that the goal verdict is not found. Um, one overarching point I'm going to make here is that we're choosing to uh, implement this as a templated function, not only for the purpose of genericness. Um, sure, it makes it a bit easier to reuse this function, uh, so we can iterate our implementations a bit easier. Um, but if our custom graph G and our context C are also header-only implementations, we give the compiler the ability to see the full context of our code in a single translation unit. Um, as such, when we compile the optimizations, we'll give the compiler free reign to make our kind of readable, readable code faster for, for basically nothing. Um, and I won't go into detail about which optimization is being made here with this compared to relatively unoptimized code, but it's, it's important to consider that the uh, compiler optimizations are going to make a huge difference on things like execution ordering and memory access. We want to get the best out of our code before we start to profile. Um, as a practical companion to our search function, we can also implement a function which uses the context object from before, uh, given that the search was successful, um, to fill, our, uh, fill some sequence with the optimal path given a goal vertex. Um, so all this function is doing is that it's going to uh, fill a sequence through an output iterator, like a stood back inserter, um, with transitions that we computed during the search. Um, the sequence is going to represent our optimal path just in reverse order from the goal. That's why it's called what it's called. So what else do we need here? Um, as mentioned, I, I introduced two customization points to our search function. The search function itself is basically done. Um, so let's start with the graph. The graph we have needs to hold our adjacencies between vertices. These are the edges of the graph. Um, it could probably hold some extra properties about each vertex, such as the physical location of each vertex in space. Um, these won't be needed for the search itself, but uh, it's useful semantic data nonetheless. Um, lastly, we want to hold on to properties about each edge. Uh, most importantly, we want to hold on to a distance or the weight or the cost of each edge, um, as well as a flag for toggling whether or not the edge is actually accessible or not. So in search, I constrained the graph type by some concept. So here's a simple concept just to check to make sure that uh, some, some key uh, methods are required. Um, and here is a full declaration of our, of our graph, kind of... Uh, that fulfills that concept. So we have some definitions for our vertex and edge properties. Um, here it's important to, note, uh, it's important to note that, uh, particularly for our edge properties, we only want to include data that is relevant to the search. Um, I'll explain more about this later. Um, we have some accessors to query about our vertex properties um, and a method for uh, calling a visitor on each edge. So when we do our edge iteration over the graph. Uh, so we have one more customization point to go over which is something to hold our search state, our search context object. This object holds a state about which vertex vertices have already been evaluated, as well as information about how we got there from those vertices, or sorry, how we got there from to those vertices. Um, and also keep in mind that we're, we not only need uh, this object during the search, but afterwards to recover our optimal path. 
Um, the last big piece of this interface is our min sorted priority queue. Um, our search context will provide a way of enqueuing and dequeuing sorted uh, vertex elements from this queue. So again, here is a, a context constraining the type with a few requisite methods um, and kind of the full declaration. Um, so it's a bit more involved than the graph, but each method is fairly simple. We'll need some method to reset the state of the search. Um, this will set the start and goal vertices, so kind of our targets. Um, it'll reset the queue. It'll reset the visit set. And uh, kind of most importantly, we can use it to do any upfront allocation in the containers we choose for our underlying implementation before we actually execute the search. Um, we have a way to check if a vertex is the goal vertex. We have um, some methods to mutate and access the visited set. And lastly, we have a few methods to um, interact with the priority queue, which is going to bring us to kind of the first implementation I'm going to go over. So with the algorithm implemented, what remains are kind of the details behind these graph and search context objects. Um, I've reduced the scope of what we actually need to make choices about. And more importantly, I've reduced the scope of what we need to optimize. So let's start making some choices. The first thing I'm going to implement is the graph. Um, we're going to start with a somewhat contrived implementation to start as a jumping off point. Um, this will make use of the, uh, the std map and std multi map containers. Uh, after all, these are, are kind of our canonical age old associative containers in the STL. And we have a bunch of vertices that we need to associate with other vertices uh, representing the adjacency in our graph. We can store these vertices with their neighbors using a multi map. Um, if we consider each vertex as a key, we'll need to allow for repeating keys because each vertex will need to represent one or more neighbors. Um, and a multi map will also allow us to iterate over these neighbors pretty nicely. Um, we can store our vertex properties as unique uh, key value pairs because you don't uh, expect duplication here. Um, our vertex property accessor methods uh, are basically just accessors that are kind of thin wrappers over std map. And lastly, we can, uh, impl we can implement our neighbor iteration using std multipath equal, equal range because it'll give us an, uh, access to an iterable range um, associated with the uh, a query vertex queue, so a range uh, over our connected vertices. Inside this implementation, we're just going to use a std for each from the algorithm header and std apply from the tuple header. Uh, this is just because the payload associated with each node of the multi map, so our edges, are themselves pairs, and we want to invoke some user supplied visitor callback on the elements of the pairs as arguments. So, onto the search context implementation. This time we're going to use std map again, uh, but the other major element here is std priority queue, which is a container adapter. This remained a constant through the implementations to follow because the STL doesn't really provide any other priority queue implementation besides this one. Underneath the hood, it's using std push heap, std pop heap, the, the kind of heap algorithm uh, functions. Uh, so we know it's a heap based queue. Um, I know that popular choices for this are, are you know, like binomial queues or a bunch of other different flavors, but we're going to keep this constant. Um, and we will use a std vector uh, to store the heap simply because it's the default underlying container used this uh, priority queue. Um, and probably the best we can do anyway. Inside the class, we want to store our active current goal, which is just a simple vertex ID. We will have our min sorted priority queue. Uh, note here that we use std greater as an extra comparator because um, std priority queue will, by default, or order elements from greatest to least with greatest at the top. Uh, and we need to change this so that our vertices with the least distance appear at the top of the queue to be evaluated next. Um, we will represent our visited set as a std map. Um, because we want to associate vertices uniquely to their predecessor vertices. Um, and here, the existence of a vertex in the map will simply signify that it has been visited. Um, and lastly, we have a reset method, which is going to ensure that we clear any stale state before we start a new search. Uh, this includes flushing our visited set and our queue. Um, and we're going to reuse this context object uh, to, as I said, do some upfront allocation, but in this implementation, since our containers don't really have any like magic reserve methods, um, we can't really do anything here along those lines. Um, the remaining functions are pretty much straightforward. They're just uh, thin wrappers around our, our containers, um, so I won't go into those too much. So given this implementation, how are we going to measure the cache performance? Um, specifically, we'll be looking at performance with respect to cache interactions because, as we initially claimed, these will have a big impact on our overall performance. 
Um, at least this first implementation, let's not expect too much. Um, so I've constructed a program, I'm not gonna show you these specifics, but what we'll do is it's gonna load uh, the spatial graph that I showed before that warehouse um, from disk. Um, and it's gonna use our search implementation to run searches between vertices in this graph. So it kind of takes a uniform sample of those because otherwise it's gonna take forever. Um, we can pretend that this behavior is like making the robot making request to some service, which would repeat well, one or more paths at a time. Um, of course, to benchmark, we're gonna be running uh, many more plans than the robot actually need. Uh, but let's just spend our disbelief here. Um, and this will give us a good idea of the performance of our search implementation over a mixture of short range and long range plans. Uh, additionally, on the back end, I've uh, randomized how the vertices are arranged in the graph after they're loaded from file to kind of normalize the effects of lucky memory placement. Um, and just to note, uh, all the performance benchmarks that I'm running are, they were done on this laptop that I'm using right now. Um, and I acknowledge that, you know, running Spotify in the background doesn't quite simulate the effects of running a bunch of programs on a robot, but uh, it's still going to give us a good idea of, of how this is doing. Um, so the first tool I'd like to use to kind of get a rough idea of cache performance is called Cache Grind. Um, it's particularly useful for running short, uh, running programs like the one that I have here, kind of toy examples. Um, it's a tool that can, can be invoked under Valgrind. Uh, it instruments our compiled code before execution, meaning we don't have to uh, recompile to execute this. It's going to slow down our execute significantly, though, um, but it's going to give us a, a few extremely useful performance indicators. Um, so these will include the number of instructions run during the program, as well as an estimate about cache performance. And I say estimate because it's going to simulate our cache. Um, the simulation assumes that the architecture has two cache levels. Uh, in the case of modern processors with more than two cache levels, Cache Shrine is going to detect this. It'll let you know on the command line. Um, and then simulate the largest and smallest instruction and data caches. So when we run it for our program, we'll see an output like this. It's not the only output the Cache Shrine uh, uh, generates, but it's kind of like a, a high level summary. Um, and first off, we can look at the instruction cache simulation results. And we notice that there are a very large number of instruction cache references, obviously, that needs to run the program. Um, but the actual number of instruction cache misses is, uh, for, for both cache levels, is pretty low. Um, we see that it reports a virtually 0% miss rate, which is great. Um, for this program, as, rel as well as the variance of implementations I'm going to show to follow, we won't really need to worry about instruction cache too much, um, because what this tells us is that our program fits pretty nicely into the L1 instruction cache and is basically never evicted. But on the other hand, our data cache is a whole other story. So we see that our simulated last level cache, our biggest cache, experienced virtually no misses. Um, but our L1 cache, the one closest to the CPU, experienced a very large number of misses. In fact, almost 10% of all L1 cache references, L1 read references, resulted in a cache miss. Here it says 9.6%. Um, so here, cache grind is showing us that nearly uh, you know, 3% of all our instructions are related to dealing with cache misses. Um, at least to me, this indicates that our program is very likely to be bottlenecked by memory access. Um, and to proceed, I, uh, you, you could um, use some of the other uh, cache grind tools, such as uh, CG annotate, uh, cache grind annotate, to kind of see where uh, in your call stack or in your, your functions uh, these events are happening the most. But um, I think it's also valuable to look at actual performance, so based on hardware perform performance metrics rather than this uh, simulated stuff. So to do this, um, I most regularly use Perf, um, which ships with most uh, Linux-based distros, so most of you probably know about it. Um, I'm fairly saying that uh, most of us in the robotics world, confident saying that most of us in the robotics world are using some kind of Linux distro, so it's available to most of us. Um, to my knowledge, there are similar tools for Windows, but I haven't really used them. I've used Vtune for Intel chips. That's pretty good. Um, so perf is what is referred to as a sampling-based profiler. Um, what it's going to do is record the state of hardware counters during execution um, at some designated rate. And what it can do is going to give it, it's going to give us insights into these things like the number of CPU cycles, instructions, cache misses, et cetera, uh, that happen in uh, particular function calls. Um, it can be run and attached to live programs, which is pretty good if you're running like a live robot system. Um, but the problem with perf, in my opinion, is that it's kind of hard to visually parse uh, the output, I mean. Um, so to look at the results that perf generates, uh, I like to use this nice program called Hotspot, um, which among other things will produce an interactive flame graph uh, 
uh, of particular events that show us which, which events, uh, which function calls contributed to the most of a particular event. Um, so here we'll, we're going to look at uh, instruction counts, cycle counts, cache misses, um, representing these flame graphs. This is going to help us uh, kind of guide us to look at which functions we actually need to optimize the most. Um, so I have some kind of pre-baked images, but I also have uh, kind of cache ground running in the background. I already loaded the results from our first implementation here. Um, and what it gives us is this nice you know, summary. Uh, we can kind of sort by uh, particular events, but what I like to look at the most is this flame graph representation. Um, so let's first look at the uh, instruction count summary. Um, there's a lot going on here. I doubt that anyone can even read this, but um, uh, I'll kind of try to explain what I'm mousing through as I go. Um, so this is showing us as kind of a stack up of our, of our nesting calls. Um, kind of at the lowest level here where my pointer is, is the search function. So that's the, the total execution from start to, to goal. Um, and then we see summaries for the instruction counts of all the calls that happened, or at least the calls that were outlined that, uh, that Perf knows about. Um, and and they're, they're nested or, or kind of arranged in terms of their, um, uh, the number of instructions that they actually uh, required to run. Um, so from this, we can see that uh, a couple of them kind of required the most work. In particular, our, our for each edge uh, function call or method call um, was pretty heavy duty, as well as our mark visited. So these were the, the calls into our std map and std multi map uh, containers. Uh, we can look at this also in terms of cycles. Um, we see that indeed that uh, our for each edge implementation is looking pretty bad. Um, it's taking the most time of most of our program, but it's also where most of the work is happening. So it's kind of reasonable to assume that that's where that would uh, occur. And then lastly, let's look at the uh, number of cache misses. So we see that there's a lar uh, that the 4-H edge method is also dominating in terms of the total percentage cache misses that happen during our program, uh, as well as the cycles. Um, so we'll probably want to dig into this a bit more. Uh, to do that, we can just click on the function um, and then kind of look at the component calls that it, it made. And we see that um, uh, part of the, the calls uh, include um, querying the visited set. So again, querying a, a stood map um, to see if we had visited a, a node or not, uh, as well as querying the multi-map, uh, which we do to iterate over our edges. So probably the, the best place to start with optimizing is going to be looking at that for each edge uh, method. So let's do that now. Uh, before I get there, though, um, I think it's probably good at this point to establish some kind of guiding principles that we're going to that we're going to kind of adhere to as we, we make the optimizations. Um, so a good core tenant to cache performance is what is referred to as spatial locality. Um, in essence, what this means is that we're going to try to keep our data uh, close together in memory. Oh, my bad. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's kind of move on here. Um, in addition to this, we want to achieve good um, temporal locality, which means that we want to try to construct our program in such a way that we're maximizing the amount of times we're accessing the data that's already in the cache. So some good rules of thumb for achieving this, um, at kind of at both, both ends, are laying out our data so it can be accessed sequentially. Um, as I mentioned before, specifically with our edge properties, we should restrict the amount of uh, data that's uh, held in these structs um, so we restrict them to the data that we actually need uh, during execution um, because we're going to be iterating over this. Um, so if you have a bunch of data in, this, in these structs that are irrelevant, um, even if they're tightly packed into memory, uh, we're going to need to hop over data that we aren't necessarily going to use. Um, this obviously affects the data that's um, going to be around the data that's relevant. And so we're going to have a bunch of irrelevant data in our cache lines. So we don't want that. Um, we should also try to reduce the number of pointer interactions in our programs. Uh, specifically, we want to avoid having to dereference pointers to access data and any linked node structures. So linked lists and maps are included in that. Um, and a sort of related big one um, is we want to avoid memory allocations during execution of our hottest code paths. Uh, I think it's a pretty well-known thing that um, mechanisms of memory allocation can be relatively slow. Uh, this is because memory allocation itself is pretty non-trivial. Um, but uh, you know, the, the general purpose allocators do their best um, when we call our, our pushback or, or in place uh, implementations, they're going to be called. We're basically at the mercy of malloc uh, when it comes to placement in memory when we use these containers. So uh, 
Um, here I'm, I'm claiming that we can get pretty far without writing custom allocators, and I'll, and I'll show you how. So does our first implementation uh, really follow these guiding principles at all? And the simple answer is not really. So let's take a closer look at std multimap. Um, we looked at hotspot. We noticed that a large contributor of our total cache misses was, were methods associated with uh, std multimap. So why, why is this so? Um, std multimap is holding the adjacencies in our graph. Uh, and we're walking over these adjacencies uh, for a given vertex at each iteration of Dijkstra's. Uh, mentally, we can model these associations with a diagram that looks like this, where we have uh, vertices and uh, some associated sequence of edge data. Um, but in actuality, as we can see from some of our perf outputs, I mean, you guys probably couldn't see it, but um, in actuality, this, this stood multi-map is, is a red-black tree, um, at least in GCC and Clang, as far as I know. Um, and these nodes of the tree are linked via pointers, the nodes themselves are placed in memory by an allocator. And since we have no control over where these nodes are placed, unless we write our own allocator, they can be anywhere. We have no way of knowing. Um, sometimes this means that even when iterating through the adjacency list, we can be hopping around memory quite a bit. Um, so it's even possible that we're creating cache misses every time we iterate to another element in the adjacency sequence, simply because um, our nodes are placed in such a way that they never end up in the same cache line. Um, in the case of std multimap, however, the story is even a bit worse than that. Um, finding the values, uh, finding the values associated with the key in a std map or a std multimap involves walking the tree until we find a node with a matching key. Um, so this applies to std equal range as well as std find. They're implemented as these O log of n search operations. Um, so even beyond iterating through our adjacencies, we're going to be jumping through nodes just to find the adjacencies to begin with, because um, we need to find them in the tree. So since our search function naturally needs to query the std multimap rather often, we find ourselves with a rather pathological case. So std multimap obviously has its uses, um, especially in cases where we require a key value pairs to be in some particular iteration order, but we're not really making any use of those properties here. The good news is that, uh, as, as many are probably guessing, we can improve things pretty immediately with a container that doesn't affect the overall structure of our, of our program much at all. Um, so in this updated implementation, we're replacing all the instances of std map and std multimap with their unordered counterparts. Um, functionally, this is a drop-in replacement. So the structure of our, our implementation of the graph remains pretty much the same as before. We still have our std equal range method in the unordered multimap. And likewise, in our search context implementation, uh, we'll swap out std map uh, used to represent the visited set with a std on our map. Um, so we measure this again. We're running the same program. Um, we see in cache grind that our simulated L1 cache misses have gone down rather significantly. Um, I also want to point out that our, on top of our cache miss rate, the total number of instructions executed in the program has decreased by about uh, half. And most of this has to do with the fact that uh, data access complexity of uh, an ordered map when we're using um, find or, or uh, equal range is way lower than that of a std map, so just to be upfront and honest about that. Um, so just comparing these side by side, we see that our L1 cache miss rate um, normalized with the number of instructions has gone down drastically. Um, and this is just by making a pretty simple change. Uh, we've, we've improved our cache performance pretty significantly. Uh, it's also important to show that in terms of cycle counts, so that the actual time of execution recorded by perf um, has gone down uh, significantly. So the speed of our algorithm has improved by leaps and bounds. Um, so to dig a bit further, let's look at why this might be in terms of our kind of guiding principles here. So again, here's a mental model of how our graph data is organized with vertices and then uh, some associated with adjacency data. Um, so std ordered map is effectively a hash map. This means that the data structure itself is comprised of an array of buckets, each which points to some kind of link list or tree structure. Um, and because multiple keys can be resolved to the same bucket after hashing, uh, access is going to involve walking these link structures to find a matching key by an equality comparison. So uh, similar to std map, the nodes attached to these buckets are placed in memory by an allocator. So at least in the default case, there's no guarantee they're going to be adjacent. Um, I tested this out in Godbolt a bit. Um, even when you, you mess around a bit, you can, you can see that uh, you know, the addresses are pretty far apart, uh, even in the same sequence. Um, so we've reduced the number of total indirections in our program by a lot because you don't have to search the tree anymore, but uh, there are a lot of potential cache misses still because during the call to equal range, um, 
we're going to be traversing this uh, tree or link list. So in order to um, uh, so in order to find a vertex, um, we're we're going to have to walk this link list again. Again, this also, there's still a potential for um, cache misses in the case of our of a hash collision, as well as in the case where there is not. Uh, but one simple change we can make to our implementation to ensure that uh, uh, we reduce the number of cache misses is to make sure that every bucket contains only data uh, associated with a single vertex. Um, so to do so, we can call reserve on our std unordered map and std multi map to set the number of buckets manually. Um, we see from our cache performance simulation that this is a pretty non-trivial effect um, on our cache miss rate. Again, it's gone down by another bit. Uh, here I'll show it side by side again. Um, our actual like time performance isn't you know that drastic, but it's still better. Um, and here we're exploiting the knowledge that our keys, our vertex IDs, are just simple integers. Um, I actually haven't addressed like what the vertex representation is here, but unless it's some kind of exotic you know UUID or something, we can normalize those to be um, a range of values between zero and n minus one. Uh, so that means that our hash value can simply be uh, the value of the key itself. Um, and then if we have a number of buckets to accommodate that, there will be no hash collisions. Um, this does not, however, affect um, when we iterate over our adjacencies associated with a given vertex. So if our vertex is a large number of adjacencies, we're still likely to see a fair number of cache misses, because again, uh, these are going to be linked lists or, or trees or, or something. So that brings us to a, uh, rather naturally, um, to a kind of like a final major iteration here, or at least in terms of container changes. Um, and that is an uh, implementation that uses std vector. Um, std vector is almost always the best choice when we're talking about you know, uh, cache optimality, and we really can't escape it. Um, here we're going to be swapping out our associated containers for a simple std vector. Um, and that's mainly because of the representation of our keys. Uh, we don't really need an associated container in this case. Um, so the outer vector is going to store adjacencies per vertex, and then we'll have some inner vector that's going to be a contiguous sequence of our edge data. Um, to reflect these changes, we have to update this for each edge method a little bit. Uh, but notice that the structure is going to re uh, remain pretty much the same. Uh, we're still going to use for each, uh, and then begin and end to kind of iterate over our edges. And then likewise, in our search comp uh, context, uh, we're going to change the visited set uh, to re be represented by a std vector as well. The only real functional difference here is that we need to represent the unvisited vertex uh, set a, a slightly different way. Um, before, we were basically just using the count method in a map to check to see if a key had existed. Uh, but now we need to kind of assign a special status to each, um, each uh, unvisited vertex because we're, we're pre-allocating uh, in this vector um, kind of all the vert vertices on a graph ahead of time and then uh, we'll need to assign them to something to represent that they have not yet been visited. And for this, we can just choose n, so the total number of vertices in the graph. Um, so when we go to see if something has been visited, all we have to do is check to see if the vertex ID has not been set to n. Um, as, our, as expected, uh, because now we've kind of tightened up uh, our, our um, adjacency lists uh, to be contiguous sequences, our cache miss rate has gone down yet again. If you look at the cache miss rates side by side, and we're making steady progress here. Um, I think, in fact, we, we've gone down by um, kind of like a cache miss rate of 60% uh, here, but where we started, we've come kind of a long way. Um, and then again, we've also increased the speed of the algorithm pretty significantly. So taking a closer look at this, uh, just to look at our, just to remind of what our graph structure looks like. Um, we know that Using a vector a vector to hold our adjacencies, we still have uh, two indirections happening every time because we, we have the first vector, which uh, you know holds a block of memory that we're indirecting through, through a pointer. Um, and then inside that, we have another vector. Each vector has its own kind of block of memory. Um, we're really just guaranteed that the adjacency data of our edges is uh, packed into a contiguous sequence. So kind of one last iteration on top of that that I wanted to show was that there is uh, uh, more we can do just by ordering the vertices in memory, um, kind of exploiting uh, the context of our of our uh, of our our search problem, um, and this will kind of vary depending on the the, the context of the problem that we're facing. Um, in order to do this, we need to update the implementation one more time. Um, so in this variant, it kind of looks the same as the last one, our vector of vectors, 
Um, but we're, we, we're going to be replacing our stood vector of vectors with uh, a stood vector of subranges from the ranges library. Um, subrange is basically just a, uh, a view uh, or a fat pointer or whatever you want to call it, um, a pointer in some range. And we'll be using it to view subsequences of a single vector of edge data, all collated into a, a single block. So that's, that's all the edges for the entire graph. So again, here we have the same number of pointer interactions as our previous implementation. Um, but uh, with our vector vector implementation, the inner vectors could be placed basically anywhere in memory because uh, they all have their own uh, you know, disjoint blocks. Um, and we've, we've now collated all that edge data into a single sequence. We don't have to rely on our allocator to guarantee that these edges are packed into a single block of memory. So we can proceed with sorting and, and make sure that it has some kind of uh, you know, appreciable effect. So the STL provides some facilities to sort things, namely std sort. Um, if we can find a single vertex sort uh, to run just once after we load the graph from disk, then it's probably a pretty practical thing to try. Um, so just by looking at our graph again, this is that zoomed in version of our uh, roadway map, we notice that there, uh, uh, one of the kind of implicit properties here is that uh, vertices that are closer together in memory are probably more likely to be neighbors. Um, so why not try to sort our vertices in a way that uh, they're, they're physically closer in memory? Um, so the, the goal here is that uh, if vertices are going to have adjacencies, that there's going to be a higher probability of um, accessing data uh, related to those adjacencies that will be already be in the same cache line. Um, so to do this, we can finally make use of that vertex property data. Uh, before I, I mentioned that it was the kind of location in space, or x and y in that 2D map. Um, we can create this sequence of indices that can be used to remap the vertex data as well as the connected adjacencies. Um, and then we can sort these indices with a custom comparison operation, which is sensitive to the spatial location of these vertices in space. Um, so here I've just sorted uh, the vertices based on their L, L2 distance or the square L2, L2 distance from the map origin, which is sort of arbitrary. I also tried um, kind of sorting with respect to the x direction and the y direction. They all seem to work fairly well, but this was kind of the best. Um, and we noticed that by running our program again, uh, we reduced our cache misses, again, actually by a surprising amount. Um, looking at the numbers side by side, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the performance boost in terms of cache misses is, is pretty significant. Um, we've also got a pretty good speed up again. And, and again, the, the structure of that program with respect to the last implementation hadn't really changed much. All we did was kind of view into some Coalition of data rather than have these disjoint vectors. Um, so to close out with some final remarks, um, cache performance is performance, whether it's high frequency trading or robot path planning, it's all basically the same hardware. So we have to be conscious about our memory sensitive choices. Those matter a lot. Um, I've shown that we can make a good dent in our path planning performance before we even make any algorithmic changes. So before we even decide to go from dexterous to A star or some like more exotic implementation, um, we can just make optimizations with our choices in how we represent that data behind the scenes. Um, in doing so, we can make uh, ample use of the STL to drive these implementations. And we can use it pretty effectively before we even consider um, implementing our own allocation strategies. So that uh, re replacing our stood allocators in those containers. Um, lastly, our hardware is complex, it's ever changing. Our cache pipelines are complex. So, I mean, I, I'm just repeating what people have said before me. Measurement is your best best for guiding these optimizations. Um, thanks. I have a link to the GitHub containing all the code that I used to do the measurement here. Um, other than that, thanks for your time. Do you have any questions? Hey, Brian. Great talk. Thanks for presenting it. Uh, I had a question about uh, one of the slides. Uh, so if you go back to the part where you instantiate the subranges. I'm using this nifty slideshow that's like 2D, so give me a oh, second. Oh, you passed it. Right here. Yeah. Um, could you explain that part again about what the subrange is doing there? Um, so what we want to guarantee is that all of the memory that we're going to be um, looking at is, is kind of packed together. Um, before, um, it was a vector of vectors. Those vectors could be anywhere in memory. 
Um, we want to, and so we're using these subrange here to just view into that second structure of edges. The edges are all packed together. Um, so we're replacing the stood vector vector, that second inner vector, with a fat pointer or, or a view. Um, it kind of felt that uh, if I left it as a vector, vector implementations, and I'm kind of just getting lucky with memory placement at the search, at the at the sorting work. But but here you can actually guarantee that everything's close together in memory. Um, so when you go to make the uh, when you go to make the assumption that neighbors are going to be also close in memory after you sort them, um, this will kind of guarantee that speed up is appreciable. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, good talk. So I'm curious. Uh, Looking at all of these slides, it looks a lot, very much like Boost Graph. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, have you done performance comparisons of what you've written here for ex examples against some of the Boost Graph examples? Uh, wish I could say yes. Um, I haven't. I've used Boost Graph quite a lot, actually. Um, I guess what I was trying to aim to do was to, in the, in the absence of availability of something like Boost, it's, it's a huge dependency, kind of show that uh, if you have kind of a specific implementation you need to do, you can kind of use the STL's jumping off point without having to use Boost Graph. Um, Boost Graph is also going to provide you with a lot of the same customizations points as, as I kind of noted here. Though it is kind of heavily templated, I, I think it's kind of, there's a lot of overhead to getting into the use of Boost Graph. It is, there's a lot of overhead. I've, I've, I've you know, had a lot of trouble getting it, but it works and it's, I've had good performance with it. So I was really curious. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with there, there's a, a a stood graph proposal. Uh, I think I might have come across it once, yeah. It'd be good to, to get your input on that as well. So, good talk. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, Brian. Nice trick with the subranges. I'm going to use it. Um, so, as you mentioned, the modern CPUs, they're trying really hard to hide the latency of caches with, you know, auto order executions and other tricks. How do you know if your cache misses are actually a problem and they're not just, you know, a counter that you're looking at and your CPU is actually spending cycles executing instructions elsewhere while it's waiting for the cache to come back to you? Um, I'm kind of going by uh, rules of thumb, which I know is kind of a half answer. Um, in the kind of performance measurements that I did, uh, I noticed that there were a lot of cycles spent um, so that the, the instructions that were being executed, there were, were far more cycles than actually instructions. Um, and that uh, probably some of that had to do with a, a cache miss or two, probably. Um, I, I was kind of assuming that beforehand that because of, if you have to jump through a lot of, oops, you know, dereferencing pointers, that things are not necessarily going to be in the same cache line. So if I'm seeing extra cycles in places where I don't expect them to be, it's probably because of a cache miss. But in terms of like rigorously proving that indeed it's due to a cache miss, um, I can't say that I, I know the answer as to how I would do that, but um, uh, at least in the inverse case where I'm showing that as you remove cache misses in terms of measuring them, that the cycle count does go down. So there's that. Sorry, it's not a really great answer to your question. Yeah, okay. Because the, that example you shown with the reserve case, right? So your cache uh, miss count went down uh, more than you gain in performance. So I was kind of curious about that. Case. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I wanted to show this kind of like a, a clarifying case that it Maybe isn't always about. Because like most of the optimizations, they actually reduce the amount of work that that's being done. Often, so like they do affect the cache effect, the heavy cache effects, but they also reduce the the complexity of the algorithm. So I was wondering, like, there's a correlation, and when we actually did reduce the effect of caches with the reserve, the performance didn't go down. That's why I wanted to show that last example with the the uh, memory ordering, right? Because mm -hmm. I didn't really change the um, yeah, the overall work. A, yeah, that was yeah. definitely. Yeah, so that was kind of like the, the hitting home point where it's like yeah, the, the, the order in memory is having a huge effect here. I mean, the, the mechanism behind how we're accessing the graph and how we're accessing these internal mechanisms remains mostly the same, um, but the memory is entirely different, the layout at least. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, first, I would like to say that uh, in the case of this implementation of the sub range, it can potentially be reduced to a single end index because you know that the end is the index set above it, like the offset. So you don't need to store an entire edge or just the beginning, and the next range will start after it, uh, which can potentially um, save some space and better fit in cache. Um, and I 
was wondering if you have any um, idea or, um, for optimization in case we need to run the path finding like multiple times or multiple agents. Are there some key points for optimization for this kind of case, like between consequent uh, pathfinding runs? Um, so in this case, uh, you could probably do things, well, first and foremost, you wouldn't, you wouldn't just use dextrous, you'd probably use a heuristic. Um, so I mentioned before that uh, you could kind of pre-compute all of the, um, the paths uh, in the simple cases, we're not dealing with obstacles. Um, you could use those pre-computed paths as a heuristic because they're always going to underestimate the, uh, the distance of the goal and then use something like A star on top of that, which is that, that is heuristic and that'll just produce the amount of computational work. Um, but are you asking more in terms of like, um, I guess, cash optimization specifically? Uh, like, uh, can be cash specific or in general? Because um, it can be a, um, a hit on performance. So, I mean, beyond like sharing that, like the, the search context with other um, agents, like uh, kind of the, the results of a search with another agent that might have to plan from the same start, but to some other goal. Um, I can't really think of anything, but at least that would encode, um, you know, some of the search problem already uh, evaluated out through some of your graph. Like it'll show you some of the visited set and then the, the other agents might pick up the work from uh, some other starting point. I think. There are a lot of flavors and variations of planning algorithms which do this, where they'll kind of like cache older results and then kind of pick up the search from somewhere else. I think lifelong planning, ASTAR actually does something like that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a kind of answer for the guy who asked about um, how you know that it's it's the cache that's a problem. So if you're on an Intel platform, uh, Intel VTune is uh, really great for getting hardware counters. Uh, I think there are similar tools on, on Linux. I don't have as much experience with them, uh, but it's uh, a really, really great tool for me to, to know why uh, I, I'm spending a lot of time uh, retiring my instructions. Yeah, um, I think Perf might also report it as well, but definitely VTune. Uh, I used it once while I was working on this, um, and uh, I saw that it reported like CPU stalls as one of the, the measurements. So. Totally. Th thanks for that. Yeah. Thanks. Great talk. Um, I just have a quick question about your slide. So when you implement the DAX trial grid, can you go to that slide, please? Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry for making you too clear <laughs> all the time. No, it's like a maze. Here we go. Here's the actual. Uh, uh, yes, I'm curious. Um, so you mentioned that you, oh, OK, you. So basically, you, you're doing a point to point, um, the shortest path. But did you do like an early stopping? Because if you do it, you do it like a run of the extra without early stopping. You basically find you know, shortest path to every, from, from a route to every, I don't know. Yeah, so if you want to do that here, all you need to do is uh, kind of change the implementation of this is terminal method. You would just make it so that it, it never stops at any any vertex. You yeah. run it all the way until the queue is empty. The search is going to return false, uh, so you don't have to change like the, the reporting of failure, but you'll have the search context full of, of basically all the ways to step from that start to any optimal uh, yeah. vertex. Uh, sorry, any, uh, use an optimal path to any vertex. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. As everybody else said, thanks. Um, I was wondering, do you have any um, any helpful pointers for how to extend this to multi-threaded applications where Valgrind doesn't usually play as nice? Um, I did get asked this question before. Um, these breadth-first search algorithms don't really lend themselves super nicely, but if you were doing something like, as you were iterating over the edges, you didn't encode, and this is a little bit contrived. I, I know that it isn't exactly like a, relating to the search algorithm itself, but sometimes you might have to do something like a, um, a lazy collision evaluation or um, some kind of heavy computation as you're iterating over the nodes where your bottleneck is no longer going to be the search itself, but uh, some other complicated uh, thing. 
So if you're doing something like a collision evaluation on every edge, you might want to dispatch that to multiple threads uh, for every node that you're attached to from a, a particular source vertex. I think that's where multi-threading has the most potential here. And so would you have to rely more on per for Intel VTune instead of cache grind at, the, at that point? Yeah, probably. Or just make a single thread. At but as soon as you start making a multi-thread, obviously you're, you're throttling the cache a lot more anyway. So your right. bottleneck is kind of shifting to some other domain. Fair. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Um, what, what the original implementation was uh, dynamic in that you didn't have to know the initial size of the graph when you started. Uh, but the the one of the major ways that you solved the caching was by pre-allocating everything. Do you have any thoughts on how to maintain that dynamic dynamicism if you had either a map too big to fit in memory or you didn't fully know the size of the map at the beginning of the search? Um, this is a good question that I don't have a satisfying answer to. I mean. Some search algorithms do, um, they do uh, kind of compute uh, some, some graph on the fly, like uh, probabilistic roadmaps does this. So it'll compute like a subgraph and then run Dijkstra's on a portion of that. So I'm kind of cheating here and saying like, you can not know a, some kind of infinite graph or some space flying graph ahead of time. Um, know the subgraph, get all the cache performance stuff from the subgraph search that you do, uh, and then just kind of do that in like a tiled sense multiple times. Um, so. It's not the greatest answer, but that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. All right, that's it. Thanks.